Hey there, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. This is our second, I wouldn't say another edition because it's really only the second one we've done. It's our THW Hockey Raiders Fantasy Draft. So if you saw the first video, we had a handful of people on and we did a snake fantasy draft where we selected members, forwards, defensemen, goalies, and we're keeping tabs on how we're doing. So we've got, including myself, seven people back to talk about their standings, their teams, all that kind of stuff. I don't know. What should we call this? Anybody got an idea what we should call this video? <laughs> Painful. Painful. <laughs> that depends where you are in the standings. I guess. For some of us, like the person, I don't know where you're seeing this from, but the person two below me is not painful at all. He's in first place. Colton Pankey's with us. Col <laughs> Colton, how does it feel to be leading this wonderful group of esteemed hockey raiders in a fantasy draft where you get bragging rights for the first, what do we, like a month, yeah. month and yeah, a half in? Nice. I mean, uh, <laughs> kind of just fell into my lap there. I had the second pick. So with dry side, I think uh, it's just kind of been a game yeah, right now. It's Carrying you on his shoulders. Really, yeah. yeah, it doesn't really matter who else I have on my team at this point, I don't think. He just seems to get three or four every night. So, yeah. It says good. the guy who has Ovechkin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's doing pretty good, too. Yeah, like I, I remember when you took him, too. You were kind of like, oh, my God, thanks, guys, for going all the way yeah, up. Yeah, I'm still, I'm still giving down. my thanks to you guys. I appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> the most motivated goal scorer in the history of the NHL, maybe, right now, is Alex Ovechkin, right? And then, of course, I don't want to do this to you, and I'm going to do it anyway, Adam. I'm going to going to point out we've talked about the top. Now we got to talk about the bottom. <laughs> Unfortunately, Adam is the bottom of the standings right now, just ravaged by injuries. I don't know. What are you thinking about your team? What are you thinking about this draft so far, buddy? <laughs> I mean, uh, a lot of my injuries are unexpected. A lot of the, I don't know really how to put it, but I think my team is very unexpectedly at the bottom. Um, <laughs> You liked you know, your team when, on paper when you started, is what you were yeah. saying. Well, it was good, but who would have expected that Cole Caulfield would have got sent down to the minors, <laughs> or uh, you know Drake Batherson would have gotten uh, COVID, so Kale McCarr would have missed time. Like you know, it, it seems like every single uh, thing that could have gone wrong went wrong for my team. Yeah, <laughs> what did, what did we pick? Was it like twelve players? What was our team? Like how big are our teams? Um, it is six forwards, two defensemen, one utility, and one goalie. Okay, so like half of Adam's team is hit by injuries. So that's, <laughs> yeah. that's, yeah. that's kind of good. Gotta, do that. That know, It'll okay. do that to you. Yeah, that, so those that aren't following closely like we are, and we watch these things every day, then that's why he's in the last place right now. So it's not like he picked really bad players, and he just didn't know, and he just randomly picked last names and said, I like that name. He just <laughs> actually got hit by, by injuries and stuff. But it's been all over the place. So let's start a little bit with just a kind of an overall rundown of what has happened uh, with this draft so far. And let's kind of go standing summary. I suppose we can run through it. So for people who, you know, we're kind of paying attention to what's going on and anybody who's watching this video that's in our fantasy draft league and is chosen not to participate with us. Colin's in first. Matthew, who's with us tonight, is in second. Uh, Julian is in third. We've got a few guys in the middle. I'm kind of toiling around the middle as well. Um, Sean and Adam are taking up the bottom, unfortunately. So <laughs> there's still I, lots of time, though, right? Like this, is anybody feeling like this thing's out of reach yet? Uh, it's all <laughs> honestly. We'll yeah, see. Sean or Adam should be the ones probably answering yeah. this, right? Yeah, I think it's injury bug and even suspensions. I know Landis God was suspended a few games, so that hit me pretty bad, and it's. I think I put a little bit too much value in hits and blocks. You know, I put uh, my utility as a defenseman, Mackenzie Weger, and I don't even think he's got a goal this year. So it's not translating as well as I would have liked. But, I mean, as you said, it's still early. There's still a lot of time for me to make a miraculous comeback because I'm coming <laughs> to the top. Sean, you I, picked the wrong Florida Panther. You needed Radko Gudis. He's ragged 17th <laughs> right now in our league just from 82 hits. Yeah. That's the guy you need. Yeah, I put too much faith into the projections and not enough into my gut because I do like the way Gudis plays. And I've heard him interviewed. He's, he's, he's a decent guy. He's a good guy. So, Okay, he's so better. I should probably ask this question. I don't know who, who's got it and who's got it handy. The points leaders, the players that are kind of helping these guys run away with the tops of the standings here. I mean, we talked to Colt. We know Dry Settle's doing really well. Whoever's got McDavid. Uh, I think Kyle had McDavid or something, right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah he He's not with us, but he's got lots of points. Ovechkin's doing really well. Who else is kind of at the top of our board? Alex, do you happen to know who's sort of – there? anybody know who's sort of leading the pack here? we got Dreisaitl, McDavid, Ovechkin, and then Matthew's got JT Miller uh, chilling at the top of the number four spot. Chris Kreider's currently number five, who's un, uh, unowned right now. Victor Hedman, by myself, is number six. 
Tom Wilson, seven because of the hits. Elias Lindholm, myself, uh, has him again with number eight. Adam Fox, nine. And that's little big rig. So at least somebody worked out for you, Sean. <laughs> and uh, 10 is Marshawn with Alex. So those are top 10. Alex, I'll ask you any of those names, any surprises? Like really, the JT Miller stands out to me. It's kind of a surprise, but what do you think? Um, I think Chris Kreider was a big surprise for me hearing those names. I mean, I know that he's a pretty valuable player seeing that he scores goals and he gets hits, but I, I don't know if you told me before the season that he'd be ranked, what was it like fourth or fifth overall? Yeah. Yeah, Fifth (laughs) overall in the entire league. I probably wouldn't have believed you. And I think most of you guys would agree with me because nobody drafted him. So (laughs) uh, most of those are power play goals too, which helps. Yeah. I'm going to very audibly knock on wood (laughs) and he's known for his streakiness so i'm you know i i talked to my uncle i talked to my friends we're all waiting for it to come 20 game goalless drought knock on wood but just haven't watched him for so long he's a very streaky player so incredibly hot start to the year i do fear for when that's going to turn around and then i fear for the rangers as a whole which is a separate topic just because their goal scoring has been kind of not exactly from who you'd expect to be from aside from him. Yeah. How much, I wonder, Cole, and I'll ask you this. How much do you think the standings of the teams and fantasy draft players reflect on each other? So we're talking about some of the leaders here, Dry Salome, David, Ovechkin, and some of the names that we've already mentioned. How much of this is reflective of just how bad their teams have been and some how good their teams have been, do you think? Like in terms of, sorry, you're asking like. Like, do you think that team's overall success really affects the individual stats of a player in these fantasy drafts? Like, do you think that makes a huge difference? Um, I mean, to a certain extent, I guess. Like, obviously, goaltenders is the big one, right? Because you got the wins and everything there. Um, I, I mean, I don't know. Like, it's obviously, like I said, dry settles my guy right now and uh, the Oilers are rolling. But I, I think mainly like uh, somebody had said earlier, just power play goals, all that. So I don't know if team success is necessarily the biggest one, but just how many points, unless we're talking about goalies. What's the thing here, Matthew, do you happen to know what's the thing that's like getting these guys in their stand? I mean, obviously goals and points and stuff is a big deal, but in this league, the way that we had it set up is like hits that big of a factor. It sounds like it is. Um, yeah. Hits, hits have seemed to be like, I've got Tom Wilson and he's, he's been, he's got the hits. He's got the, he's been scoring too, which is like, I've, I'm looking over at the times he had a four point night one time. And it's like, I didn't expect him to add that much value to my, um to my team. But uh, I think, I think hits do play a part, but I think it also has to be the goals and assists have to be part of it too, because if you just have the hits, it's not going to, really impact as much if you just have that on the stat line so Uh, go ahead sorry sorry so just really quick for context i have it up here in league settings goals is three points assists is two both power play points and shorthanded points are a point each hits are half a point blocks are half a point goaltender win is three shutout is five so if you have someone like tom wilson he gets four or five six hits in a game he doesn't have to score and he's still got the value of goals or assists right there. So that's, that's definitely helping you a lot, which is good. Yeah, I have noticed that I'll, I'll look at my guys in a given game and they might have one assist, but they've got like eight fantasy points for the night. And you're like, what's going on? And then you realize they blocked a bunch of shots or they've taken yeah. a bunch of shots on goal or they've done something else where you're kind of like, Oh man, they're making up for all the lack of scoring that they're doing by doing yeah. other things off the ice. How many of you guys picked, maybe Adam, we'll start with you. How many of you guys picked your teams based on things outside of the points? Like Adam, did you look at, the hits and the blocks and all that stuff really heavily when you made your team? Yeah, I did. Like, for example, you know, when I was looking at a guy like Andre Pilat, I looked at that he's going to get quite a few points, but he also uh, does have a lot of blocks right now. He's got 15 on the season, 31 hits. Or a guy like um, when I did Claude Giroux. Claude Giroux generally had a pretty good uh, hits for a centerman, and he had a decent amount of power play points over the last couple of years. So that was why I picked him in my utility. Uh, You know, we do have to look at other factors than goals and assists, but um, yeah, it's it's hard to predict because you could have a player who is off the charts hitting and not producing points and it's not worth it, uh, not worth it to pick up. Like a surprise would have been if you picked up Brandon Tanev, 
you know, he's one of the top players in fantasy this year because he's been off on this unbelievable start for the Seattle Kraken and he's throwing hits like crazy. So it's hard to predict, you know, these players that throw a lot of hits if they're actually going to produce. But if you can hit on one or two and get one of these players that gets 150 hits and 20 goals, uh, you're pretty set. And that's kind of, you have to, you have to play the guessing game of if one of these, you know, fourth liners, we'll call them, really does uh, turn out to be a hidden gem. So, Colton, you're leading the way here, and you've got dry settle, which we talked about already, but is there anybody else on your team that's kind of, like, been the surprise for you, the standout, you know, member of your team that maybe you didn't think would be this big of a producer for you this early? Yeah, I think uh, Johnny Gaudreau was one guy that was still available fairly late that the last couple seasons hadn't really played like he had when he first came into the league. Um, and he really seems like he's in a bounce back year this year. So he's been good. And then when you were talking about like guys with hits, I took one uh, specifically in Sam Bennett that I was hoping to provide offense. He did briefly in Florida last year and it looks like he is again, but he's a guy that runs around a lot, throws his body around. So he's really helped me in both those categories. So Sean, you have had some unfortunate luck so far, but you're you're still like you said, nobody's really out of it yet. Who's been your your kind of your key performer for you that's kept you in this, and then who's sort of been your surprise that maybe either hasn't lived up to expectations for you, or is kind of maybe maybe you think it's like dragging your team down a little bit? What's your situation? So the star of this team has been Adam Fox, the reigning Norris Trophy winner, and yet some people don't consider him the best defenseman in the NHL still. That's a conversation for another time, but he's been leading the way. He's got 71 points, and he's also been powering his way for uh, the Rangers too, which has been good to see. But I think, and I, I feel bad saying this, but Nathan McKinnon's got to be my disappointment just because he's not able to stay healthy, which considering how health, you know, how health crazy and fitness um, oriented he is, it's very, very surprising. Well, there was all that conversation about how much he's just like, ravage the rest of his teammates over what they eat and what they don't do and all that other stuff. I don't know how much of that was actually true, but it's exactly. it's pretty ironic when you hear those stories and all of a sudden he's the one guy that can't seem to stay healthy. And when he was healthy, yeah, he had 10 points, but he only had one goal. And, you know, I, I see him as a bit more of a finisher than a playmaker against semantics can be argued, but just one goal in those games, you know, you got, you got to do a bit better than that. You got to be leading that team. Julian, you're in third. What's the uh, what's the winner for you so far? What's the loser on your team? Well, I mean, I've been riding Ovechkin just because I targeted goals early. Um, le- love that you guys left them for me, and I was really excited <laughs> about that. So, you know, that was kind of my game plan is just target the goals. And uh, I want to just shout out Colton for dodging, making me dodge a bullet by uh, drafting Matthews instead of Kucherov. Yeah. He <laughs> saved me, uh, yeah, saved me a big injury there, so... Um, hopefully Matthews heats up and scores a, a couple more goals for me in here. And then, um, Lindholm has been a pretty good surprise as well. Um, cause the flames actually look really good this year. Uh, I, I don't think many had them doing, uh, as well as they are now. Um, and you know, uh, other than that, I mean, Wheeler has been the guy who's just been really, really poor for me. I, 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 that jets team is kind of putting my head in a pretzel. I, they, they're, they're so talented. They have so many good players and for some reason, it seems like Wheeler and Scheif, they're just stuck in the mud and, and spinning tires and they can't get uh, any traction. So um, hopefully they can find their games, but uh, that's, that's kind of been the, the big shock for me so far. I got, I got ragged on for taking Nick Ehlers over Scheifele in our draft. <laughs> and it's turned out to be a decent selection at that, at this point anyway, but Alex, what about you? You got a sleeper on your team and then you got a sleeper in this league that you're super surprised has done so well. I, I don't know if I'd say super surprised, but I am very pleased with how Evgeny Kuznetsov has done for me because he's been kind of an up and down player in, in past years. And I think I got him relatively late, like mid to late rounds, but he's been my second best producer this year. Um, in terms of disappointments, um, <laughs> I think Jacob Chickern was a big one. I was pretty high on that guy coming out of last season because he had 16 goals in the shortened season. And I was thinking, you know, he would maybe improve on that this year, but he's only got five points on the season so far. And I think obviously a lot of that has to do with how bad the coyotes have been. And one other mistake that I think I made was overvaluing goalies because I took Andre Vasilevsky with my first pick and no disrespect to him. I mean, the lightning had a little bit of a slow start, but he's, he's, 
obviously still been Andre Vasilevsky this year, but taking into consideration that, you know, it's just three points for a win. And then what was it? Five points for a shutout. Yeah. Yeah, uh, he doesn't have a single shutout yet this year. So he's got eight wins. <laughs> I used my first pick on a guy that has 24 fan points for me so far. So it's uh, maybe maybe not the best decision in hindsight, but uh, you, you live and learn. So Speaking of shutouts, did anybody take Markstrom in our draft? Oh, because nobody had I, the I flames doing so. this good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, I, don't, I, I don't think anybody expected. You're right, probably, Julian. I don't think anybody expected Calgary to be this good out of the game. Well, even Anderson. Did anybody draft Anderson? I, didn't, I don't even think he was I picked. Don't... I'm checking. I'm not sure. All I know is when we had this this few people involved in the actual draft and so many good goalies, I knew I was going last. Like I was going to save my goalie all the way to the end. I ended up getting Jordan Bennington, and I figured St. Louis would be a little better than they've been, but um, it's turned out to not hurt me. Like it's one of those things where I'm kind of like, yeah. You know to me, what? goalies are just so hit and miss that you know you can afford to wait, and even if you're the elite ones, they still have their their blemishes and their their roughs and struggles here and there. So. You know, when you wait on them, you just kind of get the value elsewhere first, especially with a league where the point dif- the points count so much different, where everything else is worth more and the players can give you more in other categories. Yeah, Jim, I think we were all ragging on you for waiting so long to take your goalie. But then looking at it now, Bennington's got the same amount of points as Vasilevsky. So, <laughs> yeah. I don't know how oh, I feel yeah. about that. I, I figured it would, it would hurt me a little. Like, I didn't think that it was going to be like yeah. the best thing to get the worst of all the goalies selected in this draft. But I thought to myself, you know what? If I get a goalie that even does mediocre this season, I'm going to get points from him. And I want to make sure that I pick forwards or defensemen. Now, keeping in mind, we've talked about the COVID stuff. We've talked about the injuries. I mean, who's going to see most of these things coming? So you could have picked a player first who wound up getting injured and you're screwed anyway. But it's it was just one of those things where I thought, you know what? It's probably not going to be that big of a deal. Uh, I would have loved to have gotten a goalie that's got a bunch of shutouts, but like we said, if Markstrom wasn't taken, he seems to be leading the way in that category. So, and I have in another draft, Mark Andre Fleury, and for the first like whatever weeks of the season, he was the worst goalie in the entire <laughs> league, right? So it's like there you go, right? You take the one you want, and then all of a sudden you get yeah. you get killed for it. Uh, Matthew, you're doing pretty well in this league. Uh, what's been your, you know, kind of your winning formula, so to your speak? Bread and butter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But didn't I, we do this draft on your birthday too? It was funny because I, I was like, well, it's like you're taking all my players, and then it's and Adam's <laughs> like, I'll let you get JT Miller. And like, oh thanks so much. <laughs> he's been he's been really good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Matt, if it makes you feel any better, I, I remember laughing at you because I took Brock Besser right in front of you, and I think he's been my worst player this year. So <laughs> <laughs> Miller's the only one getting consistent points, unless like some pick Connor Garland, but uh um Anybody see that meme, by the way, when Connor Garland was holding that what looked like a mini stick outside the net the other day? Yeah, yeah. Oh, my gosh. What he, was he, looked that? Like, he looked like he was trying to lay down a bunce. Yeah, he did. He looked like he had like a Timbit stick or something. It was just, I'm not sure what was going on there. I was waiting for a rebound. They never got it to the net for him to have a rebound or whatever. Uh, but, yeah, it's uh, like Rantanen has been really good for me and uh, – like Aho, actually all the players except for I don't even know I don't really except for Lonnie because he got hurt but uh, Lonnie was actually getting some points for me too and he's out for I don't know for another week or so so yeah you took some picks that I thought were maybe a little iffy like I I thought maybe you took a stretch on Michael Bunting when you took him but you seemed really confident that he was going to have a heck of a year and he's been pretty pretty decent for you right so you you're the exact epitome sort of of your team being fairly productive all the way across the roster, right? Where some guys have players who've just really catapulted their team to the top. And then some guys at the bottom that doesn't haven't done very well. You're pretty well-rounded in your team, yeah. aren't you? Yeah. I mean, Rorensky, I wasn't sure was going to do my, I mean, he's been getting quite a few points lately. Um, and Heiskanen has been good. Barry found the power play for the Oilers. So he gets points, <laughs> which is yeah, what we I was know. hoping for. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, he did what he did last year. He started off slow again this year, and now he's starting to pick it up a little bit. But yeah, yeah that Oilers so, power play something else. Yeah, and then uh, Jack Campbell's got uh, ten wins and what three shutouts. So. <laughs> what a pick! Yeah, and he's playing all the time. So, what was your mentality when you took him? Were you thinking he's going to have a fantastic year, or were you kind of like, you know what, Toronto, he's going to play a lot? Like, what were you thinking when you took him? Because it turned My out to be a fantastic that- selection. Um, I thought was but how he played in the playoffs. I mean, the Maple Leafs didn't make it, but it wasn't because of Campbell. Campbell had a ridiculous save percentage and goals against average mm-hmm. in that 
series. So I thought, oh, he'll just keep it going, and I'm happy he has. <laughs> uh, Adam, will come. Me Go and ahead, Alex Julie. too. No, I was just gonna say me and Alex too. <laughs> I'll go back to you, Adam, just because I know that you're probably the one thinking about this the most if you're thinking about this draft at all. Um, but is there something that you look at with your team that you're kind of like, you know what, I, I still got a shot here. This could turn around for me. I, I know that this player could do this or X could happen here. Like, is there something that you're holding on to just to kind of go, I, I still got a shot here? Well, the Islanders are kind of off to a bad start, which is really kind of screwing with uh, Ilya Sorokin, but they played, what, 13 games on the road. So that does play a factor. Um, So hopefully he'll start to pick up the points. But it's just injuries. And it's just like, you know, did anybody expect Cole Caulfield to get sent down to the minors after, what, two, three games? No, like, you know, he's got 2.5 points for me this year. Uh, (laughs) Like, like, how do you how do you project that? Okay, show of hands. Who had Caulfield as the Calder winner this year? All prospect quarters. No, so not even half of us, eh? I've been on the Moritz cider train for the entire year, and I'm not, I'm not straying away from that. It'll be Lucas Raymond. Raymond's gonna. Yeah, he's. Yeah, I think he's far and above. Cider's good too, but uh, I I don't see anyone else really flying to get him. Yeah, but we'll what see. about what about you, Sean? Pretty- you got anything you're sort of holding on to, grasping, going, you know what this this could this could save me. I mean, I think that once McKinnon gets healthy, like I, it's the thing is, I have such offensive firepower. You know, McKinnon, Kane, Landis, Gog, Oshie, Taves, and you know, big big Pat Maroon's got three goals in his last five games. So we're heating up, baby. He did, <laughs> I think he hit 27 that one year at Edmonton. So I don't know. Feed in from the fourth line there. But I think they just got to start scoring. Ooh. Like, that's that's really it. If, if those guys, if, if my forwards get going, I think the defense will take care of itself. It's really just getting those guys going. And Carter Hart, you know, five wins and a shutout. You got to give me a little bit more there. Now, I do want to give a quick shout-out and honorable mention. I have it up here. Uh, the 12th-ranked player on the – app is drinking if not shotgunning from cans from the fountain of youth brian <laughs> gets and 18 assists this year driving the bus captain of the ducks i mean he i bet all of us wish we could have picked him up <laughs> none of us i'm sure none of us expected that at least okay. for- well we talked about this before we came on the air here and we were talking about the ducks and just how well they've been playing did anyone take a duck like in the whole draft so. no <laughs> i wonder i wonder if someone maybe might have taken john gibson if anything maybe probably goaltender uh, yeah 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 like Even, who who's like are, we all got to be shocked though like, oh, i think it was shot you said all the california teams i totally wrote them off at the start of the year but yeah. they've all played pretty decent but yeah. anaheim's just been unbelievable i I had the crack in making the playoffs because of how bad i projected those californian teams to be now <laughs> hindsight's 2020 yeah <laughs> yeah 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 troy terry i mean what the heck uh, absolute like, alley in that kid yeah all right colton i'll ask you now we'll go to the opposite end of this because you're up at the top anything that you're at all concerned about are you like super cocky super confident you know like <laughs> i got this big old lead i'm good to go or are you no. thinking you know what it could go sideways i'm in the right in the middle i have been this whole time i've like fluctuated between like fourth and ninth and i've never really left that 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 little window but you're up there watching everybody creep on you is there anything that you're kind of like yeah this could turn for me yeah i mean like i Again, I think if it wasn't for dry settle, it'd be a lot different. Like I have some passengers for sure. Jeff Petrie has really struggled. Jason Robertson was hurt for quite a bit to start the year. Um, I mean, the good thing for me is dry settle has been a really durable player for his career, but if something were to happen there, like obviously hope it doesn't, but if something were to happen, I could be in a free fall really quick. So would the Oilers. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you know, who know, I mean, I think somebody, I think maybe it was Sean took Darnell Nurse or something, but and. Fortunately, his injury is not long term, but mm-hmm. that's what a lot of these teams look like, right? You got one, one or two big names go down, and it changes the entire, you know, what it looks like for that team to to perform well. And the Oilers certainly are in there with arguably the two best players in the league. So it's uh, it's tough. We didn't get anybody. I'm not sure if it was Sean that had the other Sean had Connor McDavid. So it would have been nice to 
get his take on his team and stuff like that. Uh, Matt, uh, sorry, go ahead. I ask, especially because you, you know, a couple of you guys cover the Oilers. Does Drysaddle, despite being the top player point wise right now, do you think he's still overshadowed by McDavid? Like, I had no idea that he was until I looked doing some work last night. He was leading the NHL in goals because oh, it's all McDavid highlight this, McDavid highlight that. I feel like he's almost, I don't want to, he's a sleeper in general, not just, you know, just because he's over, almost overshadowed by McDavid. Is, am I kind of far off with that? If he's on I, any I, other team, he gets way more hype. That's 100%. Yeah, sure. I, I feel like, I feel like sometimes he gets, I don't know if underrated is the right word, but I think that people, tend to think that he's a factor of McDavid where really mm-hmm. I think if you watch games, it's really not the, not the case. Like there was that one year when he won the heart, but McDavid missed some time. And I think his point per, like totals went up even higher. So I, I, I do think that if he was anywhere else, like Julian said, he'd get a lot more uh, respect, I guess. Underappreciated maybe. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah like, it's more like a Batman. It's not a Batman Robin <laughs> situation. It's like a Batman Superman kind of thing. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, my 12 year old son asks me all the time. He constantly asks me, like, who's the better player, dad? Dry Settle or McDavid? And I always have to answer, they're different. Like, they're just, yeah. they're different players, right? Like, yeah. Dry Settle's a better goal scorer. There's no doubt about that. Connor McDavid is way more flashy. He's got elite skill. Dry Settle's big and strong. He's hard to move. When he decides he wants to do something, he's going to do it. Like, it's just, you can't stop him, right? It's, but it's a different kind of can't stop. Like, we've seen those goals from McDavid, right? The Rangers goal and then the Jets goal and stuff. Like when he is going and you're he's dancing around you, it's the prettiest thing you're gonna watch in a hockey game. Mm-hmm. Um, and Dry Settle doesn't necessarily do the pretty stuff outside of some of his one timers or shooting and and know people who watch Ovechkin know, right? Like he can score from behind the goal line and do it on purpose. Like it's a it's a crazy kind of skill that he has, but they're just two different players, which is so cool if you're an Oilers fan, right? Because you get to watch such high skill, but two totally different players playing two totally different games. It's just it's really interesting. That McDavid goal against the Rangers, like I was watching that with my girlfriend and she's not, you know, she's just getting into hockey. And even she looked at that and she was like, wow, what? Wow. Uh, <laughs> that's good, McDavid. Uh, I don't know if that's that. Uh, well, McDavid's really good, but I, I'm looking at the defensemen too. I'm like, what the hell are they doing and stick checking McDavid for? Like they're stick checking the whole time. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna ask you guys this, and then we don't have penalty. I don't think we have penalty minutes as part of our picks, do we? We don't have anything like that. No, no. How no. many of you guys, um, maybe show hands or just answer respond? How many of you think because McDavid, we're talking about it, right? So it's obvious natural question to ask the lack of calls or the issue of calls on skilled players because we all have skilled players on our team. How many of you guys in this this group here believe that the NHL officials are not calling what they need to be calling? And then how many of you are like, you know what? No, McDavid just the Tortorella comments. McDavid needs to learn how to play within the confines of what the NHL officials are calling. Uh, who wants to take their first stab at this one? I'll go. Uh, well, in general, I just think that NHL officials suck. Like they just don't call pen. They don't call proper penalties find, ever. Find. So the fine. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who the team is, who the player is, anything. They just can't. They do too much game management, and that's a problem. Um, the Tortorella comments on McDavid, it's like, uh, good. I, we will come to the point where it's like good players are going to just adapt to what's going on. And Tortorella does have a point that in the playoffs, the refereeing does change. So there is a reason why, you know, the Oilers haven't won a cup yet with McDavid. It's because they, the referees do change. They shouldn't, you know, it should be consistent refing the whole season. They should be doing their job correctly the whole season, but they don't. Like, we all know this. Like, how many times, uh, like, last night when we were watching, Matthew and I probably noticed the same thing. Canucks-Chicago game. Clear tr- missed trip. Yeah. About 20 seconds later, the guy who did the trip scores, scores the game. Yeah, the goal. scores the goal. So, it's like, this is not like a McDavid issue. This is just an old NHL issue where... You know, the referees, it's either they call too many penalties or they start calling makeup penalties or they'll call like on the line and miss like clear, obvious ones. So it's just overall the refereeing has to be better. But there is a point to that. The, this is the way the NHL is run. So it sucks. But yeah, like if McDavid really wants to get to that next level, if these star players want to get to that next level, they do have to you know, lower their standard of, or they have to change the way their game is played to something, you know, less exciting because they're not going to get the 
calls just because that's how NHL refereeing is to start with for everybody. Is that the consensus feeling among the group here? Or does somebody strongly disagree with that? Uh, I, I just think that every crew is going to have call a game differently. Yeah. So I you agree. you're gonna have to adapt in game, and I'm a bit more old school. My view of it, like there are certain things like a trip, a trip to trip, high sticks a high stick. It's just those those ones that are kind of like maybe like some cross checking I've seen, stuff like that that I've been kind of like okay, it's mm-hmm. more of case by case. I get makeup calls, like the the Tim Peel situation. To me, that kind of makes some sort of sense, but. I think that you just kind of got to work through it, you know, and especially if you're someone like McDavid who can make them pay either way, like just, you know, you, you get hooked. They don't call it, go skate through eight people, even though there's only five skaters on the ice, you're McDavid, you can do it, go top shelf and then just flash the ref, a smile when you skate by him. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's I did I hesitated to make a comment because I cover the Oilers and I write a lot about this topic and I've had people on me and agreeing with me and all sorts of stuff and I don't want to come off like a homer but it is what it is when I watch McDavid play on a regular basis and you go man this Oilers power play is about the most potent lethal power play that we've seen in the NHL in forever and the more opportunities these guys get to to show it the more points some of these guys are going to have a couple on my team a couple on other people's teams in this this fantasy draft right. But I also don't want to be like, it's like, oh my gosh, she's never getting any calls at all, right? We see McDavid lose his cool a couple times a season already. So I don't know what to make of it. I'm I'm with Adam though. I think the officiating is just not, it's not consistent enough for me, right? And I, I hate the fact that they just put the whistles away completely in the playoffs. The fact that there's been two series, two complete series between Chicago and Winnipeg and McDavid's not drawn a single penalty. That just screams weird to me. Like it yeah. just doesn't make any sense, yeah. right? I think that people are afraid for lack of a better term that, you know, Crosby coming in, you know, was always, you know, he had the temper. He was always on the refs. They don't want that. They don't want to look like they were being hard on, you know, easy to make David and harder on Crosby. Granted, I'm sure there's been a lot of referee turnover since then. Do you think that they're kind of looking at that? Cause I mean, you could see the parallels from back then to now you got, uh, McDavid and Drysaddle is basically what Crosby Latang was. Excuse me, Crosby and Malkin was, and then Ovechkin is Matthews, etc. So, do you, do you think they're trying to make sure that that doesn't kind of come back, for lack of a better term? Like, are you asking if the NHL as a league is is looking at this situation and trying to do something about it? Kind of. A, like, do you think that they saw? I kind of. I'm sorry. Like, I kind of like sorry. parallels. You mean like I, I just think that there's a there's a difference like the way Crosby went about it early on in his career there was a lot of maturing that he had to do and we talked about this on Oilers overtime there there was a lot of maturing that he had to go through in order to get the respect of the referees to get those calls McDavid is probably still in that little bit of a stage where you know he should be getting them but he still has to earn the respect and he's not just there yet and I think it's going to happen soon where he's going to start getting those calls that are 50 50 or or quote-unquote missed um but to me, the way McDavid plays, he doesn't, he's not always complaining to the referees like Crosby was when he yeah. was a rookie. So, yeah. you know what I mean? It's not, it's not technically a parallel to me. I just think that McDavid kind of quietly goes about his business and his has reached that brim where he has to say something at this point, because it's kind of getting a little bit out of hand yeah. for what he's, he's having to bear, bear with. I think one thing, the one thing I was going to say, like in defense of the refs, I mean, the playoff stat that you read, Jim is crazy. And, yeah. Like watching all those games, they miss calls on McDavid constantly. But the one, I guess, and it's not fair by any means, but I feel like if they call the rule book specifically to McDavid, how they try to for the rest of the league, they'd be putting the Oilers on five, six power plays yeah. just based on him alone, just because really? he's so much faster than everyone. There's, he's getting hooked, grabbed, like tripped, you name it, multiple times a game, and it's like it's a, it's a weird situation for the refs because they can't just keep they want to manage the game. And if they keep giving Edmonton with that power play, you're talking about all these opportunities, like games could just be blowouts pretty much every night. Hey, Matthew, I'll come to you next. Cause I know you wanted to say something. But I'm just going to take a quick shot at that one and play devil's advocate here. Cause I will argue what comes first, the fact that there's too many power plays in a game and it lasts all year, or the fact that players learn not to take penalties anymore. That's my, that's my yeah. counter argument, right? Cause if you're hooking and tripping and slashing and you're doing all these things to McDavid, how long do you want to keep doing that? If the referees just simply call the penalties as is, 
Like mm-hmm. don't special treatment, no special, no them. Just call a blatant, obvious penalty, a penalty. And then how long before these players stop doing that? That's, that's what I'm going to say. Like, will they always just keep taking penalties and then they always get all the power plays or will they just stop taking the penalties? Like that's, yeah. that's what I'm wondering, right? Like you think players would learn to adapt defensively to just not do that anymore. Yeah. They'll and, just get walked instead. Well, maybe, <laughs> but that's, that's what happens. Yeah. And but that's got the way it would guys be. on every yeah, team. Yeah, You've yeah. got the Randons and the Matthews and the Marners and like the, these guys are just going to do that. And that's good for the game. Like that's good for hockey. It sells mm-hmm. the product. Okay. Yeah. Matthew, go ahead. I was going to say the similar thing is that uh, why the refs are like, well, we don't want to give Oilers so many power plays that they're probably going to score on it. <laughs> and I think that's the biggest case in the playoffs too. It's like, well, if we give the Oilers a power play here, you know, we're kind of saying, well, we're going to give them the game, but that's it, the other play. Like you said, that's the other players, you know, that's their, if they take a penalty. That's their fault. I mean, it's like, mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know if I don't sound old school when I say this, but it would it be the worst thing in the world for a team to win the Stanley Cup because they had a good power play? Had a good power play, yeah. So, like that doesn't seem like part that's of the strange game. to me. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like if part Toronto were to win, they've got huge skill, right? You've got Ovechkin on the power play hitting that one timer. You got huge skill on a power play. A good power play makes for a good team. Yeah. That could be one of the factors that leads. Yeah. Like we talk about it every year with these teams, and then you build the next year for the team that just won prior. Yeah. You, buy, you build a big physical team. You build a really high skilled team. You build a strong defensive team. You follow the team that came before you. Well, what if a team that wins is the best power play in the history of the NHL? Is there yeah. something wrong with that? To me, there's <laughs> nothing wrong with that. You well, know, that's, what I mean? like there's a reason why there are so many teams. Um, you look at the teams that make the playoffs. How many teams are low in their power play? How many teams? have a crappy penalty kill coming into the playoffs. Like there's a reason they're there. So why not give the same uh, in the playoffs? If they're really good because they have a good power play, they should be able to use that weapon in the playoffs too. So, yeah. So what are you saying is if you make the the playoffs because you have a good power play, you should be able to use that weapon in the playoffs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Makes sense to me. All right. (laughs) Let's, let's close this off with one go round of everybody here. I'll go first just to give you guys some time to think about it in case I'm spurring or putting anybody on the spot with this. Let's make a draft prediction. So whether it comes to our fantasy teams themselves, the overall draft, maybe a player in the league, um, some sort of prediction as we're watching these standings and people move up and down, you know, in terms of points and things like that, I'll go first. I'm going to say, and Colton, you're going to love this. I'm going to, call you the early favorite to keep winning this thing and leading it. And I'm not sure you're ever <laughs> no. actually not going to be leading unless you have some sort of drastic injury situation where unfortunately you lose three or four guys. I think you have a commanding enough lead that we're all going to be playing catch up for the rest of this thing, but it's still early. So I'll say that. And part of the reason I'm saying that is because I think dry settle wins and gets the most points in the NHL this season. As great as McDavid is, I think Dreisaitl is in an entirely different stratosphere right now. The way he's playing, the way he's scoring, he's doing things that we haven't seen in like forever. Like the amount of times he's scored, I don't know what he even is anymore. I've lost track, but how many goals he's gotten, how many games and just his ability, like most three point games and that in the season so far early on, I just, he's breaking and shattering crazy records that we didn't even consider looking at when the season started. I think he just continues to do it. And I'm with you. I don't know that he gets hurt this season. Like I hope not knock on wood. Right. But um, cause you never want anybody to get injured, but that's my early draft prediction. I think Colton runs away with this thing. And uh, I think dry runs away with the, the points uh, projection for the season. All right. We'll go the order. I don't know if it's the same order of all the windows here, Matthew, I'll go to you next. Cause you're in my top left corner. Do you have a prediction for this fantasy draft or something to watch with the league this year? Um, It's hard to argue with what your prediction was, but I'm only 17 points back. So. Well, yeah, uh... <laughs> I, I wanted to go to UNF, so you had an opportunity to say, no, 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 Jim, don't get carried away. <laughs> um, I, you know, and just say, like, dry cells, 18 goals in 17 games. So, um, yeah, it, it's it's pretty crazy. So I, I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to go with that same prediction with dry set of winning. Like, I think he he could get that 50 goals in 50 games um, and it's not far fetched. I mean, it keeps going. Um, so, I mean. Yeah, for dry saddle. I, but my prediction, I'm going to catch uh, Colton before our next update here. So, oh, oh nice. That's Confident. good. Ooh. All right, Sean, you're on my. Well, I'm looking at it. You're on the right that I'm looking at, but probably the left reviewer. So, you got a, a draft prediction to give us? I think that when all is said and done, whoever's in first place in the final stretch of the season 
uh, some sort of injury is going to knock them out of it. I think it's going to be this 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 league is going to be won because of an injury. <laughs> Are you take. saying going to be won because of an injury or going to be lost because of an injury? Because, <laughs> like, will the second place team who then winds up in first will they have been injury free? Is that what you're suggesting? I I just think that it could be a key. For instance, again, and I would never wish for somebody to get hurt, but like, let's say uh, Leon Dreisaitl goes down in the final three weeks of the season and that second place guy right now, Matthew, boom, he gets that bonus. He gets that, that boost for lack of a better term. If, if Did you say you had JT Miller, Matthew? Yeah. If he puts you over the top, I'm, I'm coming through the screen. <laughs> <laughs> to, be, to be honest with you, no, no possible. I can't, I, that would be crazy. If he was, it's funny. This trap. It's funny. Cause I I'm projecting that Miller's going to be traded this season. So he may be doing it for another mm-hmm. team by the time. <laughs> Adam, what about you? Do you have a, a draft prediction, something either with your own team, a player in general, somebody else's team? Yeah, so first, uh, Matthew actually just got another uh, two points from an assist, so he's, uh, what is that, 14 points back of first now. <laughs> uh, if that, if I'm reading the, I don't know how the, these standings seem incorrect. I don't know if they're doing projections or what. But um, one team that I think is going to uh, push over the top is uh julian's team for the i know that uh drew dowdy is on the ltir so that does kind of affect the overall of um of the team you know you're you're losing points that way but brent burns is having an unbelievable season he's a little bit low on the hits and i think that's going to pick up a bit but you also have ovechkin who is i I don't you know what what more can you say about ovechkin at this point in your in you got Matthews who's going to step it up. And then you have Crosby who's finally back from injury and Crosby is too good to not put up huge points, especially with Malkin gone, you know, he's going to be relied upon heavily. And, you know, I, I went to a game a couple of years ago where Crosby had three points and I didn't even notice. So like, that's just the type of player that he is. And I think that the fact that Crosby, you have Crosby Ovechkin and Matthews on top of Elias Lindholm and Victor Hedman with Brent Burns, who is just another player that's, you know, come out of nowhere. Uh, we thought he was done. Now he's, well, San Jose is just a whole nother topic that nobody predicted was ever going to happen. But I think that that's a team to watch is uh score. What is it? Scorio McFlurry. Scorio McFlurry, baby. <laughs> yeah. Remind me I to send you a if, Christmas card this year. For all that good I talk. think that if you're making some, uh, you know, bets, if you're putting down some money on this, uh, score you'd probably get some pretty good odds on Scorio McFlurries, and that might be a that may good be a value. line that you look into. Good value. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he's making a strong case here for me to yeah. consider. You know, he's I definitely getting a Christmas young. card. You know, I, I think the Drew Doughty thing is really the thing that's hurt me the most, right? Just the fact that he's not been able to play. Well, yeah, that that produce. and Crosby, I've been kind of two men down for most of the season, but you know, still up there third. So hopefully, right. pick are it you? Up. You're up next. Are you going to follow suit and say, yeah, I'm winning this thing? I could, I think I, I do feel, I do feel I have a fair shot. I mean, I have some ground to make up, but uh, I think Matthews will keep scoring at a good pace too. So I think I can make it up in goals. Uh, but I was going to say that along those lines that Matthew finishes in the top five of the rank at the end of the season. So I think he'll be able to to, to fight his way up there. We'll talk about a guy that scores a lot of goals in dry settle. Look at what Matthews did, right? Like there was that time when we thought he was going to get 50 and 50 didn't quite pan out, but he was on a pace. So we know he can do it. Like we know he can score in absolute bunches and just, and rip it up in a row and you never know. Right. What about you, Alex? You got any predictions to give us? You know, my prediction is probably going to be a boring one, but I truthfully think that by the end of the year, I'm not going to say Colton's going to slow down, but I do think that the final four is going to be a dog fight. And I think if by the end of the season, whoever finishes in the top four, I think they're all going to be pretty, uh, pretty close to each other in terms of points. I think uh, just scanning over the teams and looking at, you know, uh, which players each team has like Colton's team is great. Don't get me wrong, but I think there are a lot of teams that can, that can really challenge him as well. So he's got the early lead, but I think it's going to be a photo finish. So that's my prediction. No, that's a good, good choice too, for sure. Okay. Colin, you're last everybody. I've been talking to you up. Other people have said that there's some <laughs> yeah. guys that are going to compete with you here. How are you feeling I, about your own team? How are you feeling about you know predictions for yourself or I'm not, I'm not feeling as good about it as you are, Jim. I feel like uh, outside of dry settle, like I 
I don't know. Like I'm looking at Julian's team. I'm looking at Matthew's team, especially like Julian said with Crosby out like he was and then Dowdy still. I don't know if Dowdy's close yet, but I mean, those are some good players on those teams. Be afraid. Like, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I think Drysaddle's going to still be great all year, but I don't think he's going to continue to quite score at this pace. I mean, he's over goal a game right now. So I, I don't know. I'm not feeling great about my team. I don't love that I have UC Soros and that. Nashville's just, yeah, I'm not big on them. Uh, yeah, so, but yeah, we talked I, about um, how much the goalies aren't making a huge difference, right? <laughs> yeah, touche. But I, yeah, I don't know if next time we be, where we're doing this, if I'll still be number one. I, I think Matthew and Julian might both have better teams than I do. Interesting. Interesting. So it'll be, yeah, it'll be we fun struck to fear watch in him, thing. Matthew. We struck fear <laughs> in him. That's right. You didn't just convince some other people that were yeah. cheering. You convinced Colton himself that his team sucks. <laughs> Col- Colton's players are either going to be more motivated now that they know their GM doesn't have faith in them or yeah. <laughs> they're going to respond differently. Totally give up. That's right. You're all traded. Every single one. Oh, we can't do trades. Oh, crap. Yeah, we should change that next time. We'll see. Yeah, we considerations. Should, we should definitely do that. All right, guys. Well, this was fun. You know, it was. Yeah. We'll see if we can get some more guys on the uh, in the panel to join us next time and and have another update. I'm sure it'll be a few more weeks before we look at this again. Probably get through Christmas, do everything else, and then we'll come back and revisit this uh, maybe just before the Olympic break or something. But I appreciate everybody coming on and talking their teams. Uh, I'm not feeling so hot about mine. I'll probably chill right around the middle for the rest of the season. But you know, who knows? Like we said, injuries are playing a major factor here, yeah. right? So. Uh, and now that we knew when we, we set the rules up for this is you made one pick and you had to stick with it, sink or swim. And it's starting to swim, uh, help some people swim and others sink. So mm-hmm. it'll be really interesting to see where it goes. Uh, thanks. Just a quick reminder. Uh, Matthew, I'll let you do the plug. Where can everybody find all the great content that these guys and others are producing for the hockey writers? Nice. So you can uh, head over to hockeywriters.com. We got tons of content out there and world juniors are coming up. There's going to be a lot of content there. Uh, from a bunch of the guys on this panel right now so uh yeah stay tuned for that and uh of course i subscribe to the youtube channel we got a ton a lot of shows on there uh you know including a lot all the guys on here we got uh what's cracking uh maple leafs lounge oilers overtime and uh colton's also on flames face up as well so and then me with uh prospect corner so uh it's we got a, a bunch of the shows here and yeah just Take, take a look and thanks for thanks for uh, joining us on this uh show as well yeah awesome perfect and if you guys ever want to get a quick hit in the morning if you're reading our content morningskate.io is a yes. great newsletter you can sign up for too so we recommend you doing that all right guys thank you uh for the hockey raiders and everybody else in the panel this has been the second edition of the thw show fantasy draft but we will uh come back to you sometime in the early part of 2022 we'll do it all again thanks everybody <laughs>